Well, good afternoon, everyone. Buena primia tous. Welcome to Canada in the Pacific Century. My name is Hartley Richardson, and I am the chair of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. On behalf of our directors and members, many of them, many whom are here today, let me just say that we are delighted that you could join us for this two-day exploration of Asia's rise and the implications for Canada's economic future. I think you will agree these are exciting but challenging times. The world we grew up in is changing faster than many people appreciate. Our assumptions are giving way to new realities. Economic power is shifting and a new global middle class is emerging. The impact of these changes will affect all of us in different ways, depending on our businesses, our professions, our backgrounds, and our interests. But none of us, and no Canadian, will be left untouched. We're going to cover a lot of ground over the next day and a half, but perhaps the key question we want you to be thinking about is this. Given Asia's rise and the shift of power in the global economy, what does Canada need to do to ensure its continued success? Thank you again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the conference, and we look forward to working with you and your organizations in the months ahead. I would now like to call upon the Honourable John Manley, our President and Chief Executive Officer. John. Thank you very much, Hartley, and thank you to all of you for coming to attend, to participate, to be part of this important conference. Uh, bienvenue à tout le monde. Uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, uh, you'll hear from what I hope that you will agree is a pretty remarkable group of individuals, both speakers and panelists. Before we get started, though, I want to emphasize that we have invited you here today because we, should, we value all of your ideas as well. For that reason, we've tried to structure a program to encourage as much interactivity and participation as possible. After every speaker and during every panel discussion, we'll make time for questions and comments. In fact, we've invited some of Canada's best known journalists to help kick off discussions and keep the conversations flowing. You all have a tent card in front of you with your name on it. During these plenary sessions, when the moderator invites questions from the floor, simply hold up your tent card so that you can be recognized. Once you've been recognized, push the button on the microphone in front of you in order to speak, and please mention your name and the organization that you represent. Um, and by the way, the place that you've chosen to sit this afternoon, you can stay there for the duration if you wish. Just leave your tent card here. When uh, we wrap up the plenary session, we'll be, we'll be going from um, uh, the discussion with Dominic Barton directly into the first plenary panel of the day, which will be held in this room. When that breaks, there are three breakout sessions. Everyone's chosen which one they wish to go to. Just leave your tent card behind. It'll be here in the morning um, when you arrive. One further thing I should mention, if you uh, have any questions or if you need anything during uh, the conference, look around for one of the conference staff. They're wearing uh, red tags, red name tags, so that makes them fairly easy to spot. And for uh, members of the CCCE, there's uh, one, there are many differences between this and one of our normal meetings. You've obviously seen that one difference is that there are a lot more people in the room. Uh, many invitees, very senior thinkers on the topic that we're discussing, uh, decision makers from government, uh, ministers, deputy ministers, and, and others. Um, and uh, we encourage you to interact among uh, yourselves with, with all of them. The other thing to note is that uh, normally our meetings are very much in-camera uh, Chatham House rules. Chatham House rules do not apply to this conference. Uh, the plenary sessions are being uh, uh, taped and will be later broadcast on CPAC. Uh, some of the other panels are, being, uh, are certainly being uh, webcast and broadcast. 
So uh, please bear in mind that uh, while we encourage uh, active participation, that your comments and questions are on the record uh, during this conference. So with no further ado, I'd uh, like to uh, call upon Andre Demaray, who is the Deputy Chairman, President and Co-Chief Executive Officer of Power Corporation of Canada and Co-Chairman of Power Financial to uh, introduce our first speaker. And you should know that last winter, Andre and Annette Verschuren accepted our invitation to co-chair the steering committee for this conference. And we are extremely grateful to them and to the other members of the committee for their leadership and advice in putting together what I think is going to be a very stimulating day and a half. Andre, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, almost uh, a year ago, John Manley and I, along with many others, were in Beijing and Chongqing for the fifth Canada-China Business Forum and the Canada-China Business Council annual meeting. And one of the highlights of the forum was the release of a major study done by Dr. Wendy Dobson called Canada-China Rising Asia, a Strategic Proposal. In many ways, this conference is a natural sequence to that study. Today and tomorrow, we're going to take a closer look at how Asia's rise will affect Canadians in years and decades to come. We will talk about what it means for Canadians for trade and investment policy, for Canada's education sector, for specific industries and regions, and for individual Canadians in all walks of life. To set the scene, we will hear first from Mr. Dominic Barton, Global Managing Director of McKinsey & Company. Mr. Barton is a Canadian who has lived on five continents. The son of a nurse and an Anglican missionary, he was born in Uganda. In fact, his family's home there was occupied for a time by an uninvited guest named General D. Amin. There we go. At age seven, Dominic's family moved to a small farming community in British Columbia. He later graduated from the University of British Columbia and has earned a master's degree as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Mr. Barton has been with McKenzie for more than 25 years, and in 1997, he moved to South Korea, arriving there just three months before the Asian financial crisis. He played a key role in reforming Korea's banking system, and then rose to become McKenzie's chairman for Asia in 2004. He was elected Global Managing Director in 2009. Mr. Barton is active in the World Economic Forum, the Asia Business Council, and the Aspen Strategy Group. He is a trustee of the Brookings Institution and chairman of the International Advisory Committee to the President of South Korea on National Future and Vision. He recently joined Singapore's Economic Development Board's International Advisory Council also. He is a prolific writer he is, I am told, an extraordinary jogger, running many marathons per year. He is a very good writer, and his wife is a, is a very good artist also. So that's the plug for you, for you, uh, Mr. Barton. And he is a trusted advisor, I think, to governments, to corporations, an inspiring leader, a gifted problem solver, who has won the respect of many, many people around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, friends and special guests, please welcome Mr. Dominic Barton. Thank you very much, uh, Andre, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and just want to say uh, it's great to be here. I hope you will put up with me for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. Where I'm, what I'm going to try and do is just give a bit of an overview of uh, what we see as the opportunities in Asia and then some imperatives for, uh, for government, for policymakers, but also for business as we go ahead and also educational institutions. So that's just the context uh, of it. Um, as usual, McKinsey, I only can talk through slides, so I, forgive me for that as we go through it. And I've got way more slides than I have time, so I'm going to skip through some of it. But I found that actually this whole event, and I really want to commend the CCCE for moving this forward. And John, what you've done and the whole leadership group has done to get this on the table was a good forcing device to try and put some thinking 
of what, what I'm sort of seeing. Uh, what I'm, where I'm basically based is between London and Singapore, and I'm in, I try and be in uh, Asia, for example, in China once a month, just to try and keep up uh, with what's happening, as well as uh, India, and about every three months in Indonesia. So I'm gonna talk a bit about China, uh, Indonesia, and India as the three sort of pillars, in my view, of, of what's happening. Uh, so let's start, first of all, with the context, which uh, in my view is that we are very much at the beginning of a new uh, century, a new era. And that century, uh, in many ways, is a return to history. Uh, some of you are going to have seen some of these slides, and I ask for your forgiveness on that. On the other hand, I also think it's important to just keep banging the same things through because the facts don't change. And this is from some work done by uh, Angus Madison looking at uh, the world's GDP from the year zero. And what you see, and Kishore Mabobani's talked a lot about that, is really this last uh, 10 to 15 years is a very significant shift back to our history. And I think it's very important as we look to the future that we look at our history uh, because many of those important trade routes that were key back in that period of time, a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, are actually the fastest growing uh, trade routes today. If you were just to take the center of gravity by GDP of the Earth and map it out from the year one until uh, today, you, what you'll see if you just again weight that and sort of position it on the Earth is it was uh, somewhere um, north of India in AD one. It actually over a thousand years moved further towards Asia. Asia was uh, increased in its role, a lot of the Genghis Khan and so forth and what, what they were doing. And then you saw this gradual move toward the Atlantic, somewhere in, uh, in Iceland, uh, is where the center would be of the world in terms of GDP. And what you see, though, I think what's particularly telling is from the year 2000 to 2010 and 2010 to 2025, just the speed with which this transition is going on. It's, it's not just the scale, it's the speed with which it's happening. And to put that in context, uh, this is comparing this period of time with the Industrial Revolution, which many of us think was an incredible time of change. What you'll realize is the time taken in the Industrial Revolution was an order of magnitude longer and with an order of magnitude fewer people. We're talking about a thousand times difference. And that's why I believe that this next 10, 20, 30 years are going to be historic times over a 200 to 300 year time frame as we move ahead. The parts that I just want to focus on quickly, the drivers of this, are, are really three. And to me, they're gravitational forces. They will not change because of what's happening in Europe or what happens to the fiscal cliff or whatever you want to dis 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 discuss what's happening in the US. These are forces that are relentless as we move through it. Urbanization is the biggest single driver. And uh, this chart is basically to just show you in Asia, where we have the bulk of the world's population, it is predominantly rural today. There is still a long way to go for it to become urban. I think it was in January of this year that the earth became 50% uh, urban. That is not the case in Asia. We have a long way to go uh, on that front. Some of you have seen this photo before, uh, but I think it's important just to see you know, visibly what's actually happening. This was a picture I took in Shanghai in 1997. As I've joked to some of you before, some of my McKinsey colleagues, that's Pudong, you're looking at, used to call that Pud Jersey uh, over on the corner. If you look at that, basically seven years later, you see a, a dramatic shift. And this is happening not in 10 cities or 20 cities or 50 cities, but in 200 cities in China right now. And I can tell you that it's not stoppable because I remember when I was living in Shanghai, and one of our biggest clients, we don't talk about clients, but it was in a public record, uh, was the city of Shanghai. And one of the biggest challenges they faced was 500,000 people a year were moving in from the rural areas to the cities. And the first view of that was how do we stop it? We, we don't want all these people coming in. We can't handle it. And after seeing that actually that's impossible to stop that flow, there was a view of how are we going to leverage that as we uh, move ahead. When we think about uh, the next 20 to 30 years as we look ahead, it's going to be around cities. I think one thing that's important from our point of view is not to think about Asia as countries, but to think about it as cities. Some of these cities are bigger than many of the countries we see in Western Europe, but it's cities. 
And the bulk of GDP growth in the world is going to come from about 440 cities. We know, and you know, we know who they are. Uh, the bulk of those cities are actually in Asia, again, in China, in India, in Indonesia. That's where the bulk of them are. And that's where the, the consumer growth is going to be. That's where the industrial growth is going to be. And again, I would argue it's relentless. Uh, I'm now starting to take pictures in some of these cities so I can not bore you in the future, I hope, with that Shanghai before and after. These are three others, uh, three others of about 100 I could have picked of, of Anshun in Guizhou in China, Bogor in West Java in Indonesia, uh, and uh, Puducherry in, in India, Pondicherry, I'm mispronouncing it, Jam should excuse me for that. Uh, but these are cities which in their own right are going to be Shanghai's in the size and scale of, of, of what they're doing, but we don't pay a lot of attention to them uh, in, in where they're moving. We think it's important to look at these places as clusters. The way we look at China is actually as a, as, as a sort of a grouping of 22 clusters. And when you sort of see the size of them, again, they, uh, they are larger than many countries that you would look at uh, in Europe. And the behaviors in those cities are very, very different. It's, I think it's a misnomer to talk about average growth in China and a misnomer to say the Chinese think this way. It's, just, it's, it's frankly ridiculous. And I look in the mirror when I say that, because I often say that. There are just very different views about how buying decisions are made, who influences you in terms of what, what media is occurring, uh, what's important in terms of uh, objectives in life. They're quite radically different amongst, amongst these, uh, these cities. India has the same thing uh, going for it as well. There are 13 uh, Indian cities that will have a population the size of Toronto in 2030. Mumbai will be as large as Canada is today. This, again, urbanization is underway. And I would argue that despite the challenges with government in India today, all of the issues and the log jams that are going on, it's the rural growth that actually continues to drive uh, GDP growth in that, uh, that country. I'm not going to bore you with this. This is basically, if you look at cities, you can actually array where demand will be for various different products. If you are selling diapers, you can actually lay out which are the 25 most important cities for you. And they're not countries. They're cities in terms of how you look at it and how you, uh, you play it forward. Um, the consuming class, people have talked about the, the new billion. There's going to be about 900 million new middle class consumers in Asia over the next nine years uh, coming into the system. That, again, is on a scale of like nothing we've seen before. Um, and when you think about what that does for things like consumer growth and industrial growth, as I said, it, uh, it, is, it is going to be there. We think it'll be roughly about $22 trillion of consumption. Again, this is historic. We've not seen these types of, uh, these types of numbers before. And the other challenge is this is moving so quickly we think it's important that we start to move fast to be able to capture it. This, while this is going to work over the next 20 to 30 years, the changes, the, the global champions that are being born in China, in India, in Indonesia are very substantive. There are now 76 Fortune 500 companies uh, just coming from China. Uh, that's doubled uh, in the last eight years. And this, we believe, will, uh, will continue as we go ahead. Uh, Indonesia, I think, is a country that's not talked about enough. It's a very important country. It's the largest Muslim country in the world, roughly uh, 240 million people. There are going to be 90 million people uh, joining the middle class uh, by the time we get to 2030. And this is a country that, for many good reasons uh, in the past, has been ignored. But I think there is a substantive amount of change that's gone there, and one would uh, not do service to your business, I think, or to the country if you don't pay attention uh, to where that's uh, moving. And you, that gets translated into very specific opportunities, whether it be in financial services, uh, food and beverage. It's a very consumption-driven economy, unlike other places which have been much more export-driven and so forth. This is a large consumption-driven economy uh, already in where it goes, and we see lots of uh, potential as we move ahead. And when you translate all of that into uh, the demand for cars, the demand for airplanes, uh, the demand for white goods and appliances, for meat and food, which I actually think will be one of, if not the most significant business opportunity in the future, agri-food uh, that's out there, which I think Canada has a huge role to play uh, potentially in that area. 
it's going to come. Um, and the demand for resources and the issues of resource scarcity are going to be a very fundamental issue that we're all going to have to, uh, have to deal with. Infrastructure, many people believe that, well, China's overbuilt. They're building roads to nowhere. It's a bit like Japan, where there literally are bridges that go to nowhere. They don't, if you continue on them, you go off uh, and drop 30 feet onto the, onto, onto the ground. That is not the case, I would assert to you, in China, and it's certainly not the case in, in India. India is desperately lacking uh, infrastructure, and as Andre Demarais said, I think a good phrase, it's you need, like veins you need in your body to be able to keep the system going. This is absolutely critical, and this chart is just meant to show you that when we compare infrastructure build out to where the GDP is, you see that the Asian countries are still very much uh, in the small corner. This is a picture I took uh, two years ago. It's in the North Beijing station. Some of you went to Tianjin recently have seen it. This is a, a January uh, holiday trip, but you can see that if you think infrastructure works beautifully well, you have another thought coming. There's a lot more that needs to be done uh, on that side. And if you actually look at the plans that are laid out, and China is pretty good about delivering on the plans that they lay out, you see very specific targets that have been set on railways, airports, expressways, container terminals. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through the details of it. India, similarly, has a huge need on the infrastructure side. We estimate about $1.2 trillion in capital expenditure to be able to just deal with the growth that it, that it is there now. Um, and that's everything from water, sewage, again, roads, affordable housing, and so forth as we go ahead. The investment that's going on in advanced machinery, particularly in China, but also uh, actually in Vietnam, what's going on is also at a very, very high rate. And for any of you who've not seen a factory in China, it's well worth just that experience as a human being, just to sort of see the scale of it. I think Ed Burchinsky, uh, the, the photographer from Toronto, has done some wonderful work just looking at you. Literally, there's a five-minute clip where this car is racing along and doesn't get through the end of the factory in terms of, of, uh, of where things are. This is going to have huge implications on, as I said, resources. Uh, and this is one of the many areas where I think Canada can play a, a critical role. Water, we estimate there'll be a 40% excess demand versus supply of water if we don't use water resources effectively as we should. Energy, about a 25% gap, and then food, as I remember the, the CEO of Kofco telling me, Kofco imports the equivalent of 40% of China's arable land each year as they go through it. And then he proceeded to say, where can I buy some land? Uh, we need to buy land. And, we're, and again, it wasn't meant in an, an aggressive manner. It was just meant to say, we need to understand how we're going to be able to feed this rising middle class that's uh, so significant and where it is. There are obviously lots of questions and, and challenges today about the soft landing. Is Asia going to fall off given what's going on in Europe? Uh, this is what uh, executives are saying. They're still pretty strong. My own personal point of view is I'm a bull. I do not believe that it's going to be a nice straight line, and I'll talk about some of the risks. I think there will be challenges, but these relentless forces, particularly on urbanization, uh, uh, are going to continue to move on, especially as the middle class uh, moves forward, and we can talk uh, more about that later. I think it is important, I'm just going to flick to one page, looking at how China does their planning. This is a very high-level summary of the 12 five-year plan, which was released last year. And the level of specificity for, for those of you, and I know there are a number of you in the room who've seen ag the actual workings of this, is incredibly precise. And what's interesting is in this last one, uh, the first objective is to create 43 million jobs. It's quite interesting. That's a focus of what actually has to happen. And then you see some very specific numbers that they have on consumption, the need to shift more from an investment-driven, export-driven to consumption-based. You see the numbers don't actually increase that much. It's going to be very difficult uh, to shift that. And then the whole notion of the uh, sustainable uh, development um, and internationalization. It's well worth uh, looking at it. Uh, India, I think, is best to say it's in a, in a bit of a log jam is probably an understatement uh, as to say what's happening. I was just in India about a week and a half ago, just before the latest opening or reforms were done on the retail side. And I think what I noticed in the business community was an incredible frustration about not being able to get things done. That said, that economy is still growing at five and a half uh, to, to, uh, to six percent. 
Indonesia, and this will, chart will give you a headache or put you to sleep quickly, but what I, all I really want to take from this chart is that if you look at Indonesia uh, over time and you look at them in terms of GDP growth, uh, the stability of the country, the fiscal condition that they're in, the debt situation, they're actually in very good shape. A lot of people have an image of that country like it was in the 1990s when a lot of people felt they were ripped off uh, during the financial crisis, the corruption. And I think it is, is a very different country. It's got lots of challenges and issues, but it is a very significant uh, uh, country and will be on track to be the seventh largest economy by, uh, by 2030. So that's just a bit of an overview of some of the, of the I think, opportunities that are out there, the, the, the consuming class, the industrial changes that are underway. And I think, again, we should just ha keep that context in mind when we think about where we're going uh, in, in Canada. There are risks. I think volatility will be there. There's no way that growth will be in a straight line. Uh, I worry in particular about uh, rising income equality married with technology where people can see how the other half lives. And there's no question that income inequality is rising dramatically. It's a big issue. Uh, resource scarcity, uh, interregional conflict. I mean, I think we underestimate the tensions that are underway in that, in, in that part of the world. Um, healthcare challenges, we've forgotten about SARS. I don't think that everything is all hunky-dory on that front. I'm not trying to predict that we'll have a pandemic, but we have to realize there's a lot of infrastructure that's still needed to deal with on that. And then education. So there certainly are challenges uh, that are there. I'm going to, again, for the sake of time, go, go through it. So I, I hope I've just given you a bit of a picture of the opportunity. It's historic. It's massive. It's moving very quickly. And if we don't get on the game in terms of pivoting towards that on, on multiple different ways, we are going to miss out on something that is going to be absolutely critical to, I think, our success as a country. These pages are very painful to look at. I'm not, what I tried to do is put three pages, I'm going to skip through them, of building relationships in each of these countries. And it's looking at governments, the forums, the external advisors. The point I want to make with this is that many of us, and I again look in the mirror with that, misunderstand where decisions are actually made in these countries. And in my view, they're made two, three, four levels down. And so people feel very good about meeting the prime minister or meeting the vice premier or meeting the leader of a particular agency. The key thing, in my view, is to do the x-rays to understand more about where things are moving. So in China, it's the Central Party Organizing Committee, the HR department of the Communist Party. And obviously, you're not going to have an open conversation with the minister about what the objectives are, but that understanding how that group works, how people decisions are made, uh, what their objectives and focus is, what's the role of the party school and so forth is, is very important. And there are a lot of international people that are deeply respected in each of these three countries that I don't think we as business people or governments or NGOs pay enough attention to, but it's worth looking at. But these take time to build. You can't do this going on four trips or traveling in and out. These take years to build it. And that's where I think comes the opportunity for us in Canada to think about ways to go after it. Uh, four quick ideas on it. One is we think that there is a need for this, what we just call a, a tri-sector approach, which is dedicated and long-term and has business, government, and the social sector together working to drive things forward. And I think what, what the CCCE is doing today in bringing people together from different groups, what from people in Canada 2020 have done, what, what PAO is doing at the, uh, with the uh, Asia Pacific Foundation and the National Conversation on Asia, these are all meant, I think, to be ways to get us to focus and work together to drive it. And all three are needed. I don't think you can do one without the others that are, that are there. We have made some comments in the paper reading up to this. We think at a, at a government level, there needs to be an even more serious commitment. It's been impressive over the last couple of years, the shift that's going on now. I've definitely noticed it from afar, seeing what's happening. But to be able to go deep and be long-term in this part of the world, I think, requires a 20 to 30-year time frame, not a three-year time frame as, as we go through it. So these are just some of the ideas. I think the social sector, educational institutions, play an absolutely vital role. Our universities, which are highly regarded in these parts of the world to, to help uh, drive this, uh, drive it forward. We think that some of the strategic sectors needed to be focused. We put six up here, infrastructure, 
natural resources, which is a huge area in and of itself, education, tourism. There'll be 400 million tourist trips in Asia uh, in the next five years coming through it. So if you're living in British Columbia, get prepared for some big travel, for some big business opportunities on that side in which we, we, could, we could drive it. We've noticed one thing when we look and compare uh, other countries and what those countries do with their businesses, I would argue that they are more coherent and together than we are in Canada. And this is just taking an example of manufacturing orders and how much of them are actually done or signed when the government is there. And what I believe is actually that Canada, for Canadian businesses, it's lonely. It's lonely out there. You don't have, you think about what Merkel did recently on the trip with 50 German business people, by the way, including also small and medium-sized businesses, signing big deals and transactions as a forcing device to move it. I think there's something to that uh, to be able to, to move it forward. I'm gonna skip through some of these. The education side, this uh, report that was recently done, the advisory panel on Canada's international education, I think demonstrated a huge opportunity. Uh, our market share of students, if you will, is very low. These international students account for, th for, th for the third largest export of Australia. And I don't think Australia, excuse my Australian friends who are here, don't do a particularly good job of it. But it's their third largest export and they also uh, have a lot of iron ore and so forth uh, uh, going through it. I think there's a lot of uh, very good ideas that have been put forward and I think again our educational institutions have a big role. I mentioned the tourism, the 400 million uh, that are coming through. If you compare, again, what we've done versus a country like Switzerland, and I used to see this a lot when I was living in Shanghai, the number of trips where you had the Swiss, the Netherlands, uh, you, you had the French, all coming through. In this case, it was how can we get more Chinese headquarters to be based in Switzerland versus any other part of, uh, of Europe and doing all sorts of things together to make it work. Uh, the Netherlands, again, how can we uh, double the number of, of Asian companies that we have being based out of this particular area. Again, it was a group, government, business, and education working together to drive it forward. These countries punching way above their weight uh, in, in what they do. I think for the, for the CEOs, as we, as we look ahead, there are a number of things that can be done. This is dangerous to talk, talk in generalities when industries are very different. But I just wanted to, to emphasize three things. One, as I, I again mentioned before, I would not think about Asia as a, as a set of countries, it's cities. And think about which cities that you actually wanna focus on and where the clusters are. I think the other part is the investment of resources. It's very difficult for leaders to be able to invest in the future because often you're investing for the next CEO, if you will, or the next leader. If you're a publicly held company that doesn't have a long-term investor with you, that can be quite a difficult thing to push. Um, and then I think it's also revamping and rethinking organization structures, giving Asia the prominence it deserves, and there are many good examples on it. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through it. If, if you're interested, there's some examples uh, that, are, that are in here. Most people, again, are thinking about the region as countries, not cities. Um, there are many examples here of how Unilever, uh, a big tech company in India, are actually looking at their businesses now in terms of clusters of cities. It has very different economics. Uh, this is the technology company from, from India. If they look at their business in opportunities in terms of clusters of cities, their distribution costs, their organization structure is uh, radically, uh, radically different. The other thing I would just say is when we compare the Asian multinationals, the ones that are beginning to go global with the countries that are uh, the, the traditional multinationals that are out there, we've noticed a couple of interesting things on the on when we take peer groups. And the biggest interest for me on it was that the Asian multinationals are investing at double the rate that their Western peers are. Their dividends are about half, it's not just tax. Their investment rates are roughly double. They're doubling down in terms of what's actually happening. And that's something I think that uh, we, need to, uh, we need to think about. That's just a, a chart that's illustrating that. I talked about the long-term mindset um, it does take time to be able to build a successful business in these parts of the world. It doesn't happen overnight. And you look at the years to break even, these are just uh, from some organizations that we have here. It takes a lot of staying power and gut power to drive that through, a lot of patience from investors uh, as, as you move through it. And that's something I think that 
we tend to be a little too short term uh, in, our, in our thinking and, and, and where they are. And I remember an example talking to Anthony Salim, who runs a big food group in Indonesia, and I was talking about the 900 million new middle class and the opportunities in agriculture and food. And he said, he said uh, Dominic, you're a bit too short term in your thinking. I said, that's 900 million over 10 years, that's, a, that's pretty long term. And he goes, I'm thinking out to 2050. I'm thinking out when there's going to be 3 billion more people. So I'm building supply chains where, frankly, you're probably afraid to go to in Sudan and other places like that. And I said, why would you think about 2050 as a time frame? What, what, what's, and he goes, because if you have that mindset, you're willing to make the investments, and we're a family company, and I want to make sure that my grandson is proud of actually what I've built. But that's the time frame. And I, I don't want to, again, generalize Asian companies versus Western companies long term, short term, but there is some of that in terms of where it's going on. So we need more of a long-term focus to, to be able to, to drive it through. We have some benchmarks about whether, if you think this part of the world is a second home market, how much time do you spend there? How many board members in your company come from this part of the, uh, part of the world? How many of your top 100 are actually Indonesians, mainland Chinese, and Indians, as opposed to people who have, are, are Indians, Chinese, of Canadian descent. We're going to talk about the people who are actually from that part of the world and where it moves. What's your organization uh, look like? And again, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through it. I think the innovation that's going on is amazing. I just picked one of uh, Jamshid's companies. This is a refrigerator designed for rural India at about a fraction of the cost of what you'd see. A lot of, I think, innovation in business is going to be coming from this world. This isn't a low cost, low quality world where to survive you have to move that way. There is an incredible amount of innovation going on and I think you would not do yourself justice if you don't think about that. GE, we're seeing about 25% of their new healthcare products are now being designed in this part of the world. Uh, again, for the sake of time, these are just the organization charts, the prominence that's given to that part of the world. China or India or parts of Asia being given special P&L responsibility or direct linkages up to the uh, board level and not subsumed in where things are. IBM has actually centered their emerging markets leadership out of Shanghai globally uh, to, be, to be run there. We're seeing more and more of that. R&D is on the rise. Uh, we're, you know, China is going to go from basically 1.5 to 2.8% of GDP spent on R&D. That is a massive amount of money that they're going to be putting behind it. So how do we actually play in part of that game and access that talent that's going to be there, and we're seeing a lot of people that are doing it. So again, for CEOs, I think this is about looking at the clusters. It's investing for the long term and putting the structures in place uh, to be able to, to go after it, and most importantly, it's having the mindset. And I'm going to shut up at this point. I've talked for too long, but I hope I've given you a sense of a massive historic opportunity, none like we've seen before in, I would argue, our history, and a time where we have a lot of the resources, we have a lot of what this part of the world needs, and if we move and take, get our act together, I think the, the century could be our century. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is uh, Emmanuel Atravers. I'm the bureau chief for uh, Radio Canada, the French public broadcaster here in Ottawa, and I'm also the host of their weekly uh, political program on Sunday. So it's a pleasure to uh, be here with you and host this, um, this discussion. If we look back, Mr. Barnett, what you said, you talked about how lonely it is, perhaps, for businesses to try and break into those markets and how the Canadian government needs to increase its commitment. What more does it need to do after all the effort because that it's put in the last few years? Well, I think there's quite a lot more it could do. Again, there's a very encouraging uh, set of shifts that's going on. But I think that there's a, uh, for one thing, there's a level of trust that's required and opening. And I'll give you an example. If you look in the banking world where there's a lot, there, there are opportunities, being able to have a relationship with regulators, we've got, I think, so the, the, if not the one of the best regulators in the world that's here, the understanding of how financial systems work, and having a lot more of the collaboration between the, the, the relevant organization, the CBRC in this case, and Canada, and building up these deep linkages, makes it easier for Canadian businesses to then be, if you will, insiders or accepted in, in where things are. And there's many different sectors. Energy is a, 
is a huge one. I could go through, I could go through a whole series of them, infrastructure. And I think what government does is it, it provides a um, oomph, if you will. It provides some help with, with negotiations. It helps provide uh, the surfacing of opportunities, access to information. We've talked about the difficulties for middle-sized Canadian companies to go over. I think the, I think the uh, government can play a, a role in helping and helping on that side. So I think it's uh, this commitment is is very important, and um, I think it's a uh, if you don't have the trust at that level, you're one of many businesses and, and countries that's through there. And I think the the government does like to think about who and which part of the world is interacting with us. Does it need a kind of a greater long-term strategy for Asia rather than the kind of piecemeal approach that we've been seeing? I, I think it does because I think that, you know, there, there is a, you know, China is a fairly integrated place in terms of how it works, how the decisions may be made maybe in different parts, but there's sort of a view of where it is. And I think that um, it's important for a, a country and a government to be able to have a set of relationships where you can have, if, if they're bottlenecks, that often happens in deals. So a decision doesn't get made. It's very hard to figure out where, why is that particular deal not occurring? And I think when you, when you have government that's there in a relationship, that can help you at least identify where the, ch where the challenges are, it kind of as an ability to raise the issues. Um, so I think they play a key part. I think there's others though too, as I said, I think educational institutions do R&D, um, it's, it's the combination. Does anybody have questions in the room? Because this is your panel, it's for you. Anyone? No? Well, you, go ahead, John Cassidy. As a Canadian with a global perspective, uh, where would you see us in 10 years from today, given the comparative advantages that we have in doing business with China? We're now number 10 in GDP. Have we got a chance, uh, looking at the chart, it looks to me like we've got a pretty good chance to move up, but I'm sure there's others that may pass us that are below us now. What would, what would uh, represent success in your mind five, ten years down the road? You mean in terms of our position? Sure, in terms of our position in, ter in terms of total GDP. Total GDP, uh, well, I think that the, I think we have, there's a huge opportunity in front of us. As I say, it's in a sense our century. All these, we have the resources which are obviously going to be critical uh, as, as, as we go ahead in so many, different, uh, so many different areas. And I don't actually think we've uh, organized ourselves, if I could be so crass as to say that, thinking about where do we, what are, what are our strategic industries and where they go. And I think we could build some very significant uh, businesses on that side which would grow it in, in, again, natural resources, but I also say education, services. Um, I, I'm also a believer that you, we, the, the idea of bringing more people to Canada, uh, opening up on, on the immigration side, I think this is an extremely attractive place for uh, Chinese, Indians, Indonesians, Malaysians who'd like to be educated here. And I think we could attract a, a very uh, talented group of people to be based here and do it. So I think we could have actually some significant population growth. I think we'll need it on that, on that side. So I think, and, and then we're positioned very well with the U.S. And let's not forget, the U.S. is going to be a very important economy no matter what we say about where China is. I think the U.S. will, will be there. We have a privileged position with them. So in many ways, we could be in a catbird seat, if you will. And, and I, I think if we think ahead and plan, like say tourism, just as again, what, it doesn't seem like a very advanced industry or something. That's a, if you look at what happened in post-war Germany, uh, into the, and the size of the businesses that were built on that, and they're a fraction of the number of people, they're significant in what could happen. So I don't know, I wouldn't want to make, I, I don't have an idea about the prediction, but I would, I would say there's no reason why we can't be a, you know, a, a, a major player because we're vital um, in, in what that happens. You could even talk about the Arctic and the resources that are up there, and if the um, trade routes are, are changed that way, but we become even more important. So I, I feel very, bullish on that. But a lot of people, certain analysts have argued that Canada's been late in the game in getting into Asia. Do you share that view? And, and what's the window of opportunity, even though it's a, you know, it's, it's a long-term commitment, but how many years do we have to really turn things around? I, I, I do think we're late in the game, just to be honest about it. We're, I think the recent, the last couple of years, there's been a, a definitely a noticeable pivot. You can, you can feel it, you can see it, which is, I think we should all be excited about it. But you know, there's other countries that have been at, if I look at our Germans, our German colleagues, just the, the drive and the relentlessness of the, the, the German government, the, the 
way they think about their middle business, middle sized businesses and how they move in it, their cultural uh, linkages. They're always going back. Germany, you know, Siemens will talk, you know, one of the oldest Chinese companies that's out, you know, everyone's sort of bringing that back. Um, I, so I think the Europeans are, have been further down the pipe. If I look at Chile, I'll just give, just to give you a sense of speed, and I've bored some of you with this story before. I remember meeting the new foreign minister in Chile about two years ago, and he said, I, I'd like to ask for some advice from McKinsey for, on diplomacy. And I said, you obviously don't know much about us. Well, that's the worst thing you could, we're not the right people. And he said, listen to me. We need to pivot uh, from uh, the Atlantic towards Asia. And he, his aide de camp was the uh, ambassador to Austria. And he said, with all due respect to my friend, I don't know why we have an embassy in Austria and we do not have uh, an embassy to the China Investment Corporation and to Tomasek, and he named off about 25 cities. It was kind of that, and that's down in Chile, right? The sort of, the, and that's obviously, he's talking out loud, but that, the, the pivoting that's going on in South America, and obviously their trade, it matters a lot, his, is, is their acceleration is at a higher rate uh, the, than, than we are. The number, the invitations, and another thing I'd say is, how many, what, when's the last time we've had a large group of Asian CEOs to be able to, come and talk with government, more than trying to help the country and move forward, more as friends, if you will. If I look at what the South Americans, even African countries are doing, um, you, you see a, a shift. What, why is it that the Asian countries are more open to having advisory groups than the United States? I'm, I'm, I'm blocking a whole bunch of different places. So I, I just think there's a lot of more that we can do. It's good that we've moved. And the reason, I do actually think there's a window because relationships and um, trust are, are formed uh, you know, over time. And I think he or she who has the relationship with the longest time wins. And other people are building those relationships. And um, we, we, what I worry about is we'll always be there because we have the resources, but we, could, we won't be shaping. We won't be able to, I think, get even bigger benefits for what happens here if we don't go deeper and longer. Does anybody else have a question in the room? Yes, the side the back. Sorry, I, I can't see your name on the. Yes, you. Uh, Chris Katarna. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in Chinese politics at Oxford, <coughs> um, and sort of the, the China Sherpa in chief for uh, for Dundee Corporation here in Canada. Um, and I just want to pick up on, on this point of of thinking longer, of getting business to think longer term. And, and I guess the, the skeptic question is, is it possible to get Canadian business to, 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 to think longer term in terms of elongating executive decision making, um, just given the realities of investor expectations? Or is this kind of a, a permanent distinction between public ownership and, and state ownership uh, in the economy? I, I think it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, the thing I would be looking for, I think we need to have more long-term investors, and I think that you can look for them. It doesn't, you don't have to be a family business, though I think there's a lot of big benefits you can get from that, uh, from, from being a family business. But I, I think our pension funds, which are some of the best in the world, I, I was always surprised when I went, this is not Asia, but if you forgive me, going to Brazil, and again, looking at food, uh, and I met this company called Tarpon, which is a private equity firm that's invested really in building Brazil foods. And, I, and it's, it's an amazing, this company is amazing in terms of the size, the you know, farming areas, the size of Belgium, the technology that's used and all this stuff. And I said, where did you get your, I mean, how did you get the financing for this? Because these guys are, they're 35 years old. They're sort of, and I, and I they said, oh, you probably wouldn't have heard it. They know it's Canadian. There's a organization called the Ontario Teachers. And you probably don't know who they are, but they're, it's teachers' pension money, and, they're, and they provided you know, several billion dollars for, for doing that. So we've got actually long-term funds here uh, to be able to do it. And I think, we, I, I think that's what we need to do. I, I also learned, it was from Tom DeKino, it was one of the trips I remember uh, when, when, when the CCCE came through. And I remember saying, actually in some frustration, I said, how, you guys come over on these trips. But, and we were in India, I think, at the time, and I said, how come there's not more Canadians investing? It's, you know, I, we get, what, what, and he said, I'm like, first of all, do you know what the average time frame of a CEO is? It's about five years. And when you look at the U.S. market and the opportunities, it's, you know, it's not going to be done in your time frame. So, so people are not irrational. It's kind of some of the issues. And what, 
so what I think is that may be the case, but I think we do have to think about, it takes time. I showed you those break-even numbers for even organizations like P&G and L'Oreal and so forth. It didn't happen in a quarter, that's for sure. So I, I think we, we have to, we have to we, th this investment, there has to be more health measures, in my view, in the performance of a company, not just performance measures. And one of the health measures I'd look for is, are you relevant in, these, in, in that $22 trillion market? Are you going to be relevant? And if you're not going to be relevant there, um, I, would, I would worry as an investor about, about that. That's an easy thing for me to say. But, uh. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Robson. Bill Robson from the C.D. Howe Institute. Um, sort of thinking a little bit about the next panel, uh, I think it's the natural focus for us to be looking at these markets as places that we sell into. But turning Canada into a platform where the best jobs and the be most exciting uh, products are going to be created, the inputs uh, from Asia are vital as well. And I wonder if uh, uh, we could just talk about that for a moment, some of the opportunities there to make sure that we're totally integrated into the world, doing good things and thinking of Asia as a source of people and ideas, uh, capital and goods and services. Yeah, I definitely think that's the case. I mean, the, again, if we just think about the, what the Swiss and the Netherlands were doing about trying to attract headquarters, you know, they're not trying to do that for tax purposes. They're actually trying to do that because of the secondary effects that you're going to get from innovation and jobs and so forth, especially the Swiss and what they're doing. And I think Canada can provide an incredible platform for that, given where we are in the U US and Mexico, uh, for example, uh, given the cities that we have. I mean, this is again, I, I, there are so many of the friends of mine on the Asia Business Council have a winter or summer house, depending on what you want to call it, in Vancouver. They, they, they have a linkage, a natural linkage to that, that part of the world. But I think if we were to be able to get uh, you know, attract people like the R&D. So I go back to food again. The, the technology development in food is going to go through the roof. Right now, to me, some of the biggest players are the Israelis uh, in Tel Aviv doing a lot uh, in that. The British are, are, are doing a lot of that. And in Minneapolis, we, I think by attracting the R&D money to be able to go into that in pl places like Guelph, um, Saskatoon, uh, Calgary, the whole shale gas area, the opportunities that go on and that money, what, China can invest some of that money in this part of the world, so right away you'd get that benefit. And then as you said, these innovative companies that come through, I mean, you know, the, if you think about the innovation going on with the, um, whether it be in medical products or, met, or healthcare um, or uh, transportation and logistics, uh, to be able to have those players here is going to be important for our businesses to be able to be uh, successful. So that's why we've mentioned six of those kind of strategic industries, infrastructure. And I think there's a lot that could be, we could build the platforms here. Why, why don't they make their base here? It's interesting, why is New Jersey, why did New Jersey become a headquarters for a lot of the South Korean companies? It certainly wasn't because they were, the New Jersey you know, government went over to try and attract Koreans, it's because there, there happened to be, it was actually schools. It was a, lo a lot of uh, Korean in, in the different businesses, LG, Samsung, Hyundai, I can tell you, they had their kids go to school. That's the only, in New Jersey, you had then Korean restaurants, and I don't want to overdo it. And then all of a sudden you get a, all of a sudden New Jersey's become a center for a lot of South Korean, but it wasn't a strategic, you know, it would be the opposite of what we would ever try and do, but that's how it happened. And, and I think that there are many clusters that we could, pull together uh, on that. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Monsieur Di Maria, allez-y. Yeah. Paul Demery from Power Corporation. I wonder if you'd comment on <clears throat> the evolution of services, because we were all in the last 20 years very taken with manufacturing and the, the strength of manufacturing in the Asian world. And now they're educating such large numbers of, of engineers, math uh, degrees. And you look at our schools, we're having a hard time with our draw our dropout rates and the amount of kids that are going and, and getting these diplomas. So I worry both about the services revolution that's probably coming on, it is coming on, and the innovation revolution, which we thought we were going to keep in our world uh, for some time to come. Um, but yeah. how could you comment on that? Well, that, you know, I might just take that too, Paul, to, to a broader edu education point, because I think that the, um, you know, there's no question, if you look at the number of engineers that are just being 
produced, if I could call it that, in Beijing in the order of you know, 200,000 a year. It just overwhelms what, where it is. And people could say, well, the quality is not as high as what you'd see at Queens. I can tell you that quality, we, we're recruiting in those, these places. We see it, the, the quality and the talent in there is, is high. And I do think that we underestimate the innovation levels that are going on in China, certainly in, uh, in, in India, because of just the focus on science, if you will. And I think that there is a danger. If you, if you even look at the internet, we always talk about Google, uh, we talk about Amazon. Well, you, people should take a look at, at, at Tencent, and you should look at some of the, the Baidu. You should look at some of the Chinese players in terms of what they're doing and the engineering that's going on. And so I think that there is a risk if we don't, we, we won't keep up because a lot we are losing in that race, and we're definitely seeing it in the U.S. And I think that we, we could also, though, attract more of that talent to be able to do, the deg do, do their degrees here, the PhDs and so forth. And I think if we don't, you know, the technology change, I didn't talk about that. I, we talked about the rise of the East. The other big sh massive shift is just technology, which is changing so quickly. And one last thing, I'm talking for too long here, but you talk about you know, digitizing companies. Everyone understands that a media company is pretty well 100% digitized. My, my own personal view is financial services companies are moving from kind of 10% to 50% digitized. People, there's some UK banks now that are going to have 50% of their sales coming from mobile and internet as they go through. Mining companies, mining companies talking about being technology companies. So I, I, th I think it is a an, an area of, uh, of high importance for us to be in it, and the amount of money that, that they're putting into it, again, 2.5, 2.6% of GDP overwhelms what, where, where we are. That's all the time we have for this panel, so Mr. Barton, thanks a lot, and uh, I will leave you in the hands of my colleague Anthony Germain from CBC with uh, a great uh, panel of guests. Thank you very much. Thank you.